Welcome back, everybody. Before we begin, I um, I need to make an announcement, which is that tomorrow morning I will not be here. I'll be downtown in Chicago getting my first vaccine, and we will have instead a Dharma activity. So uh, please show up, uh, and uh, it'll be a little bit different than our usual morning program has been. So. I wanted to start out today um, just taking up the next sections from where Flint left off of Uji as a launching pad for what uh, what I'd like to talk about today. So I'm going to read that um, first few sections following what Flint read. So it'd be seven, eight, uh, nine, and 10, uh, just to give us a basis for what we're gonna talk about. Dogen writes, do not think that time merely flies away. Do not see flying away as the only function of time. If time merely flies away, you would be separated from time. The reason you do not clearly understand the time being is that you think of time only as passing. In essence, all things in the entire world are linked with one another as moments. Because all moments are the time being, they are your time being. The time being has the quality of flowing. So-called today flows into tomorrow. Today flows into yesterday. Yesterday flows into today. And today flows into today. Tomorrow flows into tomorrow. Because flowing is a quality of time, moments of past and present do not overlap or line up side by side. Qingyuan is, is time, Wangbo is time, Xingqi is time, Shido is time, because self and other are already time. Practice enlightenment is time. Being splattered with mud and getting wet with water is also time. Although the views of an ordinary person and the causes and conditions of those views are what the ordinary person sees, they are not necessarily the ordinary person's truth. The truth merely manifests itself for the time being as an ordinary person. Because you think your time or your being is not truth, you believe that the 16 foot golden body is not you. However, your attempts to escape from being the 16 foot golden body are nothing but bits and pieces of the time being. Those who have not yet confirmed to this should look into it deeply. The hours of horse and sheep, which are arrayed in the world now, are actualized by ascendings and descendings of the time being at each moment. The rat is time, the tiger is time, sentient beings are time. Buddhas are time. So here I have to mention that these uh, animals were um, the way that time was designated. So it was the hour of the rat or it was the hour of the horse in, uh, in Dogen's time. At this time, you enlightened the entire world with three heads and eight arms. You enlightened the entire world with the 16 foot golden body. To fully actualize the entire world, with the entire world is called thorough practice. To fully actualize the golden body, to arouse the way-seeking mind, practice, attain enlightenment, and enter nirvana, is nothing but being, is nothing but time. The golden body, this body, is in this time, just as I am right now. Before we leave the subject of being time in the body, which I talked about on Tuesday, I'd like to clarify something that may create some misunderstanding of the Buddha's teaching. In the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha taught the contemplations on the repulsiveness of the body and the contemplation on its decay and death. He devoted quite a bit of time to various concentration practices on this topic. 
Ultimately, Ananda informed him that some monks were mutilating themselves and even committing suicide because of this teaching. The Buddha was alarmed. He quickly assembled the Sangha and delivered a Dharma teaching that meditation is conducive to well-being and happiness. And if you are not finding this, you are doing something wrong. So there is no mention of concentration practices on repulsiveness of the body or its ultimate decay in the Anapanasati Sutta or later teachings. But why did he suggest this set of contemplations in the first place? Is there something wrong with enjoying a healthy body, a good meal, the touch of a loved one? Is the body really disgusting? Are ascetic practices that deny the body any pleasure what the Buddha is suggesting? We might suspect that there is actually an important teaching that was terribly misunderstood by some of his followers. I think we need to investigate this more closely to avoid falling into some practice traps. As I understand this teaching, the Buddha was well aware that many people spend their lives in pursuit of pleasures of the senses and the body. That was true in his time, and it is true today. These pleasures are always fleeting and ultimately cannot provide ultimate satisfaction. Whenever one sense desire is gratified, another arises. For that reason, sense pleasures are dukkha, unsatisfactory. That in itself is not problematic. What is problematic is when we spend our precious life's time and energy in pursuit of sense pleasures and bound up in grasping and aversion and ignorance about this pursuit. It is our clinging and longing for the pleasures of the senses that wastes our precious life. Of course, we appreciate and delight in a delicious meal, a beautiful sunset, a deep sleep after a busy day. But if our life is bound up in seeking sense pleasures and avoiding what displeases us, it is a kind of animal existence. We've missed something deeper, more satisfying, and ultimately more true and real in our life. It is not something you need to seek or grasp or attain, and it is not some rare accidental experience. It is always immediately available in this moment of time being. Our preoccupation with pursuing sense pleasures is therefore a distraction. When the Buddha had emaciated his own body through extreme ascetic practices, almost to the point of death, he recognized that this pursuit also was not the path to higher knowledge or vision. Then he recalled his experience as a boy, falling into a natural state of reverie and ease while sitting under a rose apple tree in spring while his father was plowing. He had this realization, why am I afraid of that happiness that has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and unwholesome states? And he thought, I am not afraid of that happiness that has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and unwholesome states. I considered, it is not easy to attain that happiness with a body so excessively emaciated. And so he took some nourishment and sat calmly under the Bodhi tree. This was the beginning of the Buddha's enlightenment. In his teaching of contemplation on the repulsiveness of the body, its decay and death, the Buddha wanted to break the trance of grasping after sense pleasures and the opposite trance of ascetic denial and deprivation of the senses. Neither way leads to ultimate knowledge and vision. Neither way fulfills our aspiration and our vow. In his steadfast sitting, the Buddha was embodying the path of the middle way. He did not dismiss the enjoyment and delight of living, but he knew and taught the difference between those pleasures that are superficial, fleeting, and ultimately unsatisfying to those that are ever present, profound, and absolutely satisfactory. One road leads to suffering and the other leads to liberation. Since the Buddha recognized the mind as one of our primary sense organs, Sense pleasures also includes the various pleasures of the mind and its displeasures. So today I'd like to turn our attention to being time and our experience of heart and mind, which in the Pali, Sanskrit, Chinese, Tibetan, and Japanese languages are not separate constructs. Heart mind is the best translation for the character in those languages. I assume that the distinction between heart and mind must be a construction of Western philosophy. So we've commonly come to understand them as separate. So today I'll follow that distinction a bit because I want to talk about being time as experienced in our thoughts, 
ideas, memories, plans, and models, and separately as our experience of emotions, moods, and feelings. They are both deeply implicated in our lived experience of time. So thinking about this, um, I have my map. Um, I was thinking, returning to the idea that I discussed in my first talk about the experience as individual, the experience as collectives, and this historical experience. So we're quite familiar with the uh, concept of the mind uh, as this uh, individual experience of ideas and plans and theories and models, <coughs> memories, and, uh, um, and also our heuristics, our sort of uh, rules of thumb or um, sort of life hacks for thinking, um, our views, our conceptual knowledge. Uh, so we have uh, principles and beliefs and, uh, and, and there's a time of learning, a time of application and a time of forgetting in the life of the mind. Collectively, uh, we have uh, family time. So family time is uh, uh, composed of all kinds of mental constructs, rules, lore, tales, memories, um, taboos, uh, dreams, thought styles, um, all of which uh, help us situate ourselves uh, with a certain kind of identity. So, uh, so that's a sort of collective way the mind works together. Um, the things we know together as a family or a clan or a tribe, which has tribe has uh, structures and legends and stories. And those stories are often about origins, hardships, adversities, and, uh, and alliances, um, triumphs. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then we also have a kind of collective understanding of mind that's part of our work um, and our workplace and involves meetings and goals and oftentimes milestones and mission statements and memos and hierarchies and gossip and and the history of the organization or the workplace where we're working. <clears throat> so beyond that, there are collectives that are communities, which are kind of publics, um, and they involve stakeholders and uh, concepts of divisions and connections, um, infrastructure, inclusion and exclusion. Uh, those are all concepts and mental concepts of collectives. And so uh, oftentimes in these collectives, uh, measurement and assignments and appointments, hurry and worry, alignment of time scales uh, is important uh, when people are working together. Uh, there's this also a kind of notion of time as a sort of economy. So we don't want to waste time. And then is this time productive or not productive? We have a notion of saving time, which... Um, when my sister was living in Japan, she had three children under three and she and they were all in cloth diapers. And so she wanted an automatic washing machine. She had a ringer washing machine in Yokohama. So she was talking about this with her neighbors. She had learned to speak Japanese, colloquial Japanese. And so she's talking to the other mothers and she's explaining to them that she wants an automatic washing machine. And they were completely baffled. They said, why? And she said, well, so I can save time. And they, and they looked at her in complete confusion how could you save time? How how would that how would you how would that even work? Um, and and she said, well, so that you have more time. Well, that was even more confusing. How could you possibly have more time than the time there is? So she said, well, uh, um, you know, so you can have more time to spend with a family. And but they were spending time with the family. They were spending time with the family doing laundry. So they could not get their mind around this concept of saving time. And so then she said, well, let's take turns walking our children to school. You know, we can each walk all the children to school. And then, uh, and that, and so they looked at her completely baffled again. And she said, well, you know, that would, that would save some time then. And they said, what do you mean? And she said, well, you, you'd have some time to do other things. And they said, well, what we want to do is walk our kids to school. So the whole notion of saving time was a non-starter as far as they were concerned. They had no idea how you could possibly do such a thing. So we have this sense um, also of being efficient and, and we can accept the idea of rest as long as it's a boost to productivity. So if you rest, 
then you'll be more productive. So these are some of our sort of collective uh, assumptions about time. And then in historical terms, this quality of time and mind means um, the rise and uh, maintaining and eventually dissipation of ideas and trends, um, innovations, creativity and discovery are sort of on the upside of that uh, scale. Um, and then there are movements, uh, there are trends and fads and things like that. They're all part of a historical moment. So if you're a certain age, you're always going to understand the historical moment when 9-11 uh, happened, for example. Um, so, and the movements that are spawned in a particular time, the Nazi movement, um, and we see, oh, you know, there's a kind of arc there. <clears throat> also historical are certain methods and practices, which are ways of um, uh, trying to get to answers for the big questions that we have. So in the sciences and psychology and sociology and anthropology, um, there are key questions in those fields and the methods are the ways that that we go after the answers to those questions. <clears throat> and then there are, of course, historically the horrors, the cruelty, the destruction, the wars um, that also have this quality um, of anchoring uh, time being for whole generations. And also uh, certain beliefs and knowledge that uh, that again is our uh, the time being of a historical moment that we share. <clears throat> so, so I was thinking about this and thinking about um, there's some meta concepts that cover both the qualities of time being of the heart and the qualities of time being of the mind, um, and those. Meta concepts include stories. So stories connect ideas and emotions, right? And, um, and the benefit of stories over other forms of information sharing is that they're subject to multiple interpretations and those interpretations might even change over time. So if we do an experiment and we get data and we come to a conclusion, that's a pretty fixed thing. Um, and it would take new data to make a new story out of that uh, uh, whole enterprise. So uh, so stories connect these ideas and emotions, they're bound up together, and even in so-called hard sciences, it's all tied together by stories. So the scientists get together at conferences and tell each other stories about the things that, uh, that are important to them about the questions that they have. So stories tie things together and um, provide a sense of time being that in, in essence stands outside of time. So if we tell the story of Paul Bunyan, or we tell the story of Cinderella, or we tell the story of Romeo and Juliet, it has a certain seemingly timeless quality, and yet every age understands it differently. And every culture understands it differently. So, um, but we do have these shared stories, and oftentimes the reason we feel connected to someone is we share the same stories, um, and we understand the stories the same way. Uh, another kind of meta concept is the concept of systems. So whether you're talking about an individual, which is a collection of systems like the circulatory system and the nervous system and so forth, as we talked about an embodied self, but there are also thought systems and that we sometimes call that conditioning or sometimes we call it an internal family system parts, uh, but there are, there are uh, thought systems and Joko would often have people do thought labeling in order to help them see the systems that they were using to think with. Uh, so in systems, in adaptive systems, there are these flows. Uh, the systems are distributed. That means things are not all happening at one site. They're distributed. They're also embodied, as we talked about last time. Um, and what we're talking when we talk about systems in terms of flows, flows of energy, and information and resources and how those move in uh, throughout the system. So living systems are adaptive. They're always trying to find a kind of a harmonious uh, balance between chaos and order. That's where living systems live, right on that boundary uh, between chaos and order. So, but they're subject to perturbations and those perturbations might be large or small and the effects on the system are not dependent on the size of the perturbation. So a tiny perturbation might impact the entire system. 
whereas a big perturbation, a big disruption might have relatively little effect on the stability of the system. This is one of the things that's so interesting for people who study complex systems. So, <clears throat> so uh, scientists say that uh, the state of a system in any given moment is a representation of the history of that system up to that point, the entire history of that system up to that point. Uh, so in Buddhist terms, we call this the fact that everything is subject to causes and conditions, right? And what they are in this moment is a kind of representation of all of the causes and conditions that have, that have created them. So in terms of talking about the heart, um, I think we understand the emotions that we experience as coming and going. Uh, we, we recognize, oh, these are impermanent experiences and they don't have any solid substance. And yet they're powerful and impactful. So they're both physiological and also connected to mental constructs. So the mind and the heart are really not distinct in terms of um, uh, not influencing each other. Um, Anyone who's done any real serious work in science knows the uh, emotion that you feel when something clicks, when an, uh, an idea you had works, or a theory you had tests out. So, so the physiological experience and the thoughts, the concepts are, uh, are connected and dependent on each other. Um, and our um, conditioning is sort of a history of that and our interpretation of it of our experience. So consequently, um, we form attachments. And those attachments may be a source of joy, they may be a source of happiness, as we were talking about earlier in the inquiry, um, pleasure, but those attachments are also subject to ruptures, um, to absences, to loss, to conflict, to sickness and old age and death, and all of the ways that uh, our connections and relationships can be disrupted. When we talk about uh, heart or emotion states, um, again, we're talking about individuals. So my experience, my longing, my heartbreak, uh, my sadness and grief at the loss of a friend, uh, my worry, you know, uh, all of the emotional things that are uh, individual, but there's also collective emotion. And we see, we've seen quite a bit of that over the past few years, right? Uh, a, a lot of expression of collective emotion in the um, Black Lives Matter movement, um, in the protests, in the, in the ways that people have come together to express collectively a shared emotion. Uh, we see it in families. We see any, any place there's a collective is subject to emotions. Um, and it doesn't matter how uh, antiseptic the workplace might be, there's still emotions running rife that are collective emotions, dread, fear of layoffs, um, uh, joy at a big contract, um, all of those things are collectively shared. And then historically, I think also this issue of heart has a kind of um, uh, historical time being. So at one point, uh, children were not really regarded as any special beings, they were just little worker bees. And they, they were uh, viewed as sort of um, uh, uh, a kind of um, maybe indentured servants, right? And then we came to have a different view of children. And that view of children keeps evolving into something new, right? Some, our attachment and affection for children is something that has a historical um, kind of unfolding. The same for uh, our 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 emotion states around women or people who are other or animals or the environment. I mean, I, for many, many, many generations, the environment was viewed as uh, sort of the site of our ambitions and we were going to bend nature to our will. And I think uh, we've come to a different historical feeling and relationship around the environment in the present day, in current time being. For many people, not for everyone, but for many people, so we know that um, time and heart, and this being time and being heart, uh, emotions come and go, they're fleeting. 
And when we, uh, when we encounter a person, a place, or a thing, we have a feeling tone uh, and it evokes an emotional response. <clears throat> we may be um, quite skillful in suppressing that emotional response. Uh, it may be uh, a social necessity. For example, we're meeting people at work we don't really care for or we disagree with. Um, and we have to uh, have a kind of social facade that enables us to, uh, to not necessarily come straight from the heart. So I'm thinking about this. I think the thing I want to share with you is something because we often think that emotions are um, like love. Uh, love is a love is not an emotion. Uh, happiness is an emotion. Sadness is an emotion. So I, I I'm going to share Sorry, with you. Sorry, Peg. You just you're touching your mic with your papers, I think, and it's causing. Oh, oh, sorry about that. Okay, no worries. Making things, um, it's rattling things, huh? Yeah. Well, I wanted to share something with you that I, that was really thought provoking for me when I first encountered it. It's a little piece by Ligia Dantes, and we've sometimes have used this in our uh, in our services. It's called "Love Beyond Emotion," and here's how it goes: As long as our relationships are dependent on our emotional state. We cannot enjoy peace among others or within ourselves. Emotions spring, swing between extremes and are too varied in intensity for the entire human organism to live a harmonious life. A change in this way of functioning is desperately needed if peace is to prevail in the world. Love is true neutrality. It does not judge or evaluate. It does not feel good or bad. Since it is not mere thought, it does not change into an opposite. It does not like or dislike. It does not blame, so it does not need to forgive. It does not have choices or preferences, opinions or positions. It does not dictate, is not authoritative. Love does not differentiate between life and death. It has no expectations other than what is. Love is not an ideal to venerate. It cannot be known through knowledge or thought. Love is not words, but the energy of life itself, without opposites, without death. Love is a way of being, experienced by humans and visible only in our actions. Life and love are synonymous. They are the eternal activity of universal energy without boundaries, movement, or form. Love being all encompassing is the context of all contents of the universe and thus is infinite. And what is infinite cannot be known within the finite mind. Only in a state of being that is beyond the finite human mind form can love be the manifest. Thus, love is manifest, unmanifest, form and emptiness. Our minds can express it only in paradox. Love is all life is, and as such, can only be lived. So this is the essence of time being. <clears throat> and obviously, emotion states in as well as the mind are also subject to some other meta concepts. Um, they're subject to power uh, and all of the issues around power, including autonomy and control, collaboration, conflict, inclusion and exclusion, responsibility. Also, <clears throat> they're subject to the three great marks of existence, our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, our heart, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and uh, this final um, quality, which is often abbreviated as no self, but which I think of as um, dependence, emptiness, boundlessness, 
Uh, so that sense of uh, spaciousness without a center. These systems clearly uh, implicate each other. When we talk about the heart, we're also talking about the mind. When we talk about the mind, we're also talking about the heart. We are in love with our ideas. We're in love with our opinions and our beliefs. Um, we support them. We grieve over the opinions and beliefs of others with whom we disagree. Uh, a lot of families have been torn apart emotionally because of ideas that are so held as fixed views that differ from each other. A lot of people have suffered uh, in terms of uh, racial injustice, both emotionally and also uh, psychologically, so mind and heart both, not to mention embodied ways. Uh, these things are so embedded in each other and they're so deeply connected to each other as time being but we experience them differently. We experience, in my view anyway, we experience the, the heart, the deep, deep love that Ligia Dantes is talking about as a kind of timeless experience, right? It has a time, it's outside of time in the way we conventionally think of time. It has a kind of eternal quality to it. So uh, that's what I think uh, is correct about what she says. It doesn't have an opposite. Hate is not the opposite of love because hate is time bound. It's not eternal. So this is the question when approaching Dogen, this time being, we need to investigate this very, very thoroughly. The time being of the heart, the time being of the mind, how long you hold a grudge how wrong you think the other person is, uh, how attached you are to your own views, how much you long for uh, and cling to uh, relationships that nourish you emotionally or psychologically. So when I was in graduate school, um, of course, you're in an academic enterprise where much of the uh, effort and much of the attention is given to ideas and theories and models. And people get very excited about a particular theory, a particular model. Um, and they get very agitated and angry with each other because they don't agree with each other's theories and models. And from the outside, it looks kind of comical. You know, they're fighting over very small distinctions that you and I don't even think are important. But they're really, you know, the, the lifeblood of the academic enterprise. Um, so they actually become quite emotional about these theoretically abstract intellectual constructs. Um, and on the other hand, um, you can see how people's minds become consumed with their emotions. And they, they think over and over and over again of that wrong that that person did to them, or they, um, they worry about whether a person likes them or other people like them. So our mind becomes preoccupied with our emotion states. And these things are very, very intimately connected to each other. So when we are practicing time being, um, it's, it's one of the things we can investigate is these different dimensions of the time being of this being and of this collective being and of this historical moment. Um, what is the time being? So we look backward, we can see the time being of the Great Depression or the time being of World War II or the time being of the Revolutionary War or the time being of the Buddha. Um, and we have to imagine, we have a sort of act of creative imagination to imagine that time, even, you know, though there are gifted writers who have written in descriptions, it's hard for us to project ourselves into what those people experienced in that time. We get little fragments or glimpses of it. But similarly, in our own time, if we're not paying attention, it's like we're not really there for it. And we miss uh, the essence of the time being. So we're in, I think, very profound changes in the middle of very profound changes in the way that we live in the world. Uh, but we can't see them clearly because we're right in the middle of them. And we can't understand how they're going to turn out. We can't even understand how they originated. We can see some of the causes and conditions, but not certainly not all of them. And 
those causes and conditions are impacting our present time being. And what we do in this present time being will similarly impact the, and create the causes and conditions for what happens in the future. So that the time being in that essence, in that sense, um, radiates into the past and into the future and in, influences both the past and the future. It's a very hard uh, paradoxical way to think about time being. It's, um, it's easy to think in terms of just this moment as a very short uh, little span of time. You know, it's just this moment, just pay attention to this moment, you know, and it seems like it's what's right in front of you. But this moment is wide, it includes everything. It includes not only your own thoughts and feelings and embodied experience, but that of every single other thing here in the world, in the cosmos. And that I think is um, when you really become aware of that, there's this boundless quality of this present moment. Um, it's, it's kind of awe-inspiring if it isn't completely terrifying. Um, and it makes it hard to understand, I think, for me anyway, my ongoing uh, question and difficulty in understanding, it's really hard for me to understand cruelty because when you under, really grasp this, when you really understand, we're all in this moment together. And every single being in this moment, every living being in this moment is subject to suffering. How would it make any sense at all to increase that suffering by one particle, by one tiny, tiny fragment even? So our embodied experience, our mental experience or psychological experience, our emotional experience is always changing. It's like the weather, always changing. And yet we, we try to hold on to it. We try to hold on to the good feelings. We try to hold on to the great ideas. We try to hold on to feeling healthy and well. And no matter how hard we try, we can't, right? <clears throat> we can't, um, at this stage in our lives, um, live the nine-year-old body. We can't live the 26 year old mind. We can't live the heart that fell in love and was swept away. We have to live the time being we're in. And that's not like a container. This is what Dogen is saying. Don't think of it as like a container, um, this time being. It's the 16 foot Buddha. It's the wrathful deity. It's all bound up in this um, body and mind and heart. And so next time what I'll be talking about is uh, a little bit the spiritual path, the spiritual time being, uh, which is yet another aspect or dimension of time being. Um, but they're all like facets of one thing. So you shouldn't think of them as separate. They're facets of one thing and they're dependent on our view. So um, I think we have uh, some time for breakout groups. And it looks like we have 22 people. So again, uh, five groups of four and just take us up until uh, 12 o'clock. <laughs>